Okay, so the young lady, she's going to play on a violin. It was in the Holocaust in some camp or some ghetto, we don't know. We know that according to the condition that we got this violin. But this violin now have a very special history. We made a documentary about the story of the violins of hope, and we went to do photos in Auschwitz, Birkenau. And Maestro Shlomo Mintz, who played here last Sunday, played on this violin in the place that the orchestra of Auschwitz played and in the place that the women orchestra in Birkenau played. So this violin now has a full history. And uh, there is one thing that I don't think that you can see it from far. There is a Star of David on the back. The violin is in very good shape now. And I hope that she can enjoy to play on it because that's the most important part. And you enjoy the sound. Okay, so I thought it'd be interesting to ask uh, Amnon and Avshi some of their experiences with the Violence of Hope. And uh, as a historian, I can't help but try to think chronologically about certain things. So I'd like to start with the question for Amnon, which was, can you tell us a little bit about the very first instrument that you came into contact with that you do had a connection to the Holocaust? The first one that I got is a Zimmerman violin that is also in the exhibition, was in the concert, will be in the concert. Um, the story is very simple, we can say like that. In Warsaw, there was a Jewish violin maker, Yaakov Zimmerman, one of the three known Jewish violin makers in this time. He made the violin for his very good friend, Shimon Krongold, and in the violin, there is a label in Yiddish with the Star of David saying, I made this violin to my loyal friend, Shimon Krongold, Warsaw, 1924. There is a photo in the exhibition of Shimon Krongold playing on this violin. When the German invade, invade uh, Warsaw, he ran away to Tashkent. There, he got typhus or something like that and died. This is a victim of the Holocaust because if he should stay at home, nothing should happen to him. He asked one of his best friends to bring the violin 
to the Krongold family in Jerusalem after the war. So at about 46, there is a full story about it in the book, a guy approached the family Krongold in Jerusalem and asked them if they know Shimon Krongold. And they said, yes, this is our uncle. So with a little bit discussion, like always with Jewish people, in the end, they bought the violin, they kept it for many years, and the moment that the son, Nadir Krongold, heard about all these violins of hope story, immediately he approached me and told me the story, brought me the violin, a year later we bought this violin, and this is the first violin that we had in this collection. These two Star of David, one in the label, one on the back of the violin. Shimon was a commerçant, or much more, a, he had a factory for Dantel. And in his room, he had a special stand of music. He played whenever he could. And Jakob Zimmermann is by us famous for, he was a sponsor of Ida Hendel, the greatest Jewish violinist, and then Michel Schwalbe, concertmeister of the Berliner Philharmonic Orchestra, and the teacher of my father. The day that my father decided to immigrate to Israel, he said to everyone that all the Jewish people are playing the violin and they need somebody to repair them. So he went to Jakob Zimmermann, he learned to repair the instrument and came to Israel 38. So we are here. All the rest of the family, the German took care of it. I want to go back a little bit earlier than that. There was a, an instrument that visited your shop in the 80s that had a background in the Holocaust. It didn't become part of the Violence Road Project. But could you speak a little bit about that instrument? <clears throat> This was before, before, before everything. In those times I was afraid to touch the issue of Holocaust. <clears throat> and a man who played in Auschwitz on the way to the guest chamber for, I don't know for how long time he played because all the time the players change, but it was at least one year or one year and a half. And he saved his violin, of course, because for all the players the violin was very important. This was an instrument that saved their lives. <clears throat> he came to Israel, and when he had a grandchild, he wanted that the grandchild will learn to play the violin. So he brought me the violin, told me all the story. Then I learned a lot of things about all the all the story of playing violin in the camps, which is something horrible. And I opened the violin and inside there was a black powder that there was no other explanation for this powder than its ashes from the crematorium. Uh, we checked it up sometimes and one day I couldn't see it anymore and I buried it. Anyway, I lost all the connection to this family, unfortunately, otherwise the violin should be here also. I think they left Israel. And in addition to that, you, it turns out you also happen to have some instruments in your shop that, that your father had purchased with some connections to the Holocaust of the Road, correct? <clears throat> very, very much correct, because, the, how to say it? All the name and all this project of Violence of Hope, the beginning is the foundation of the Israel, the Palestine, of course, um, Philharmonic Orchestra, beginning to a symphony orchestra, that Bronislav Huberman, the very famous Jewish violinist, one of the greatest of our time, living in Germany, he understood what's going on. And then he did all what he could to persuade how you are saying all the best of the best Israeli uh, Jewish musician to come to Israel 
and to create the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. Until the war, 100 people arrived there, and the meaning is that 1,000 people were saved from this war. They were in Israel. All the people who could not stay in Israel and went back to Europe, we know today none of them survived the war. Now, those people who came to Israel, most of them from Germany, Austria, and Poland, a big part of them, I think if once I will do it a little bit much more research, maybe I will be able to find the percent they played on German-made instruments, because in those times they were very good, and all the Jewish musicians and the German violin makers, there was no friction between them, they were the best clients. Now, each musician who came to Israel knew that in Israel there is nothing. Even strings, they had to order it from Europe. There was no violin maker shop, nothing. So they brought with themselves two violins, three violins, two violas, three violas, two cellos, three cellos. In a case <clears throat> something is happening, they can send the instrument to Europe and then they have another instrument that they can play on it until the first one is coming back. To create this orchestra it was not so easy and always I'm telling that if it was not Huberman and not Toscanini, no orchestra. Huberman was the man behind the idea, which is a huge idea because this is all our school of music, all the teacher, all the musician and some of the composer. And Toscanini is the only one who could handle with the hand of iron, we are calling it, a hundred Jewish musicians. Because when you have hundred Jewish musicians, you have a thousand different ideas and somebody had to control it. And one of the famous stories about that, Toscanini was very, very known for his shouting in rehearsals and concert also, all the time in the record also. He came the first day, no shout at all. And the musician began to talk between themselves, ay, 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 he doesn't like us. Okay. Next day, the same, nothing. Then they was worried. He doesn't like us. Then the third day, for all the other two days, boom. He was beginning to shout like crazy. Everybody was released. He likes us. He stays with us. <laughs> and that was the beginning of a huge orchestra. They played. My mother, she's always, she always told me that many of these concerts I, was, I heard because I, she was pre pregnant with me. Now, 45, 46, all the atrocities of the war arrived to Israel. Then it was a boycott on any German made, not important what, from car to bow of a violin. And the musician who had German instrument, some of them broke the instrument, some of them came over to my father telling him, if you are not buying the violin, I'm going to break it. And for my father, a broken violin is impossible. He bought each instrument people brought to him. Then that's why we have a collection, knowing that he can never sell them again. Now, I had a German student from Dresden, Eastern Germany. The guy, you know, in Eastern Germany, Holocaust didn't exist. Of course, there have been very good Germans. And uh, when he learned about the Holocaust, about two years he was sitting, I'm calling it, on my neck to do a lecture about all those instruments arrived to Israel because of the creation of this orchestra. <clears throat> we did a lecture in Dresden for the German Association of Bowmakers and Violin Makers. Two hours and a half of a lecture with 250 different diapositive of all these instruments of my collection. The lecture was finished, nobody was able to say one word. After midnight, people began to ask me questions, which never stopped. Coming back to Israel, I had a special radio interview, 
And then I asked people who have violence with the story of the Holocaust, because I knew many people played in the ghetto, in the camps and everything, and I wanted to get these instruments. And the first one was this Jakob Zimmermann violin, and then, you know what is a snowball, especially here in Cleveland. You have one, you have another one, a bigger one, a bigger one, and now this collection is about 60 different instruments. And always I, my big hope is to find more and more and more, because now it's the last days that we can find them. Later on, nobody will know anymore what it is. Most of the survivors never spoke about the Holocaust. Most of the people who were in the orchestra saved the instrument, but they didn't want to see them anymore. There are, that continue to play after, very few of them. We will have the son of one of the famous ones, Annette Walfisch. She played the cello in the women orchestra. Her son, Raphael Walfisch, is going to play the next concert with the CIM and they're going to play Kol Nidre and the Avinu Malkeinu. So he is continuing the line of his mother in this case. She could not come, unfortunately. And I want to ask something you said. Uh, the violin from Auschwitz, the first one that you saw in the 80s, uh, you said that at the time you weren't ready to, you didn't want to deal with Holocaust type subjects. Could you go into first a little bit more detail about that, specifically about what it was like uh, growing up in the Weinstein home and uh, your father and your mother's reactions to, to hearing about the Holocaust? I have to say one thing. I was born in 39, two months before the war. My father came from a place named Volkovisk, when he decided to play the violin, we will not go to all these stories now. The best school for violin in Poland in those days was Vilna, Vilnius, and number one violinist of the world, Jascha Hefetz, is from Vilnius. Doesn't say that my father can play, could play like Jascha uh, Hefetz. But anyway, this was a place of many, many top musicians, especially in violin field. So, he came to Israel, he put up his workshop. He was connected to all the musicians in Vilnius. And by the way, he was crazy for Klezmers, and all of them have been his best friends. And the war ended, and there were, it was the beginning of survivors coming to Israel. Most, many of the survivors from Vilnius came to our house. They knew my mother, and you know, they knew, of course, my father. And I remember them all like it was yesterday. The people were coming, most of them they were still very hungry, very not healthy, let's say, staying in our apartment. And I remember my memories from this time that they tried to take off the numbers of the hand all the day, rubbing it. Then every time in the evening, they took the pieces of bread and hide it under the pillow in the bed when they were going to sleep. That was my memories. And crying every night. And later on, I didn't want to be exposed to the Holocaust. We, all the children in Israel, we could not understand what it is. And I had, I don't know how to say it. I grew up with no grandfather, no grandmother, no cousin, nothing, nothing. The German took care of all of them except one brother of my father. And most of my friends, it was the same. And when I asked my mother, where is my family? So she took out the book from Ponal, from Vilnius, and showed me the place where they killed all the almost 80,000 people of Vilnius and showed me, here are, here they are your family. And then she could not speak anymore. I was growing like that. We, Passover and Rosh Hashanah, we were four people. My father, my mother, my sister and me. And that we, until we got a little bit more friend and more friend, 
and we've been a little bit like a tribe, and today when we are doing uh, Passover, there is no place anymore in the house. In Tel Aviv, you don't have the huge houses like here in Cleveland. They are a little bit smaller. But I still remember all of that. And let's say, to come back to the violin, most of the violinists, the musicians from Vilnius knew my father. Especially the Klezmers, they like him very much because they knew that he is in love with this music. So they came to the workshop, and me as a little boy, the first word in Yiddish that I could learn is Spielta Bissele. Because he never done anything to a violin of a Klezmer without that he played before. And uh, even I can tell you a story of Pinka Zuckerman, he's one of the great violinists today. His father and my father, they played in an orchestra in Vilnius. And one day, Papa Zuckerman is coming to my father and asking him, my son wants to play the violin, so please give me something. So my father took a violin and gave him a violin. Three months later, he's coming back and then he's saying, you know, my son is saying that this violin is not a good one. <laughs> so my father told him, bring this boy immediately back. He brought the, boy, the little boy, seven, something like that, how old he was, after three, four months playing the violin, yeah? And he asked him, what you can play? So the little boy said, everything. So my father opened music and told him, play, and he played. And he's playing until today. And all the young generation, they came over to us. Still, they came people to my father from the Holocaust time, but for me it was not, a, not something that I can even think about it. And by the way, you have to understand my family, because you ask, now you have to, the, the answers. My wife, she's coming from a partisan family. The famous Bielski partisan is a defined movie with Daniel Craig, that is our uncle for three hours. So in this case, for my son, it's on one side he has my family, 400, almost 400 people killed, killed in the war, and then from the other side is his mother coming from a family who saved 1,230 Jewish lives in the war fighting the Nazis and saving people. So it's a combination that is very rare and very special because in the Bielski there was no music. There was only the music of the, I think the Russian instrument is called Nagan, something like that. They knew very well to shoot with them. So I'm growing up in post-Holocaust Israel, not wanting to really confront the Holocaust, even after you saw this instrument from Auschwitz with the, with the ashes inside. So it wasn't until the mid-90s or so, if I'm, if I'm correct, that you really started to think about the role that music played in Jewish lives, specifically the violin. And some of that through your, the, the lecture you mentioned a few moments ago in Berlin. But I, I can't help but wonder if also around that time, it was about the same time you started training your son Avshi, correct? Sometime in the mid-90s or so? Yep. And so I can't help but think about you, know, you in your workshop at Tel Aviv, the same workshop that your father had trained you using the same tools and techniques to train your son that your father had used to train you. If that also was part of the, the spark that inspired you to start thinking about your lost heritage. Most of the violin makers in the old time, they were teaching their sons to go and to continue. All the huge Italian families, German families, French family, families, they were going from father to son to grandson and continue, continue, continue. Uh, if you are po opening a book uh, of violin makers, sometimes you can find a family that there are 200 people that were active making violins and bows. The students that came over to us, his family is 200 years in the business of bow making and violin making. So that's very common. And of course, father and son, it's very difficult on one hand, but on the other hand, it's 
much more easy, let's say, because then he is in the house and he knows everything. And along those lines, actually, maybe you could just could you pick out an instrument from the collection and sort of walk us through what what is it like when you receive it, and what steps do you need to take to bring them to the point where they can be played in concerts like the one we heard the other night at the Cleveland Orchestra. Um, it varies very much between all the instruments because some of them, when they arrive, they are relatively in good condition, so. The restoration wouldn't take very long. It wouldn't be easy because most of them are very simple instruments and to bring them to the condition that a professional violinist can play them, enjoy them and actually sound good, it's not a very easy process. But uh, some of these instruments are arriving in very bad shape and the restoration can take four months, if not more. And it's to repair all the cracks and then basically to put them together. We had one single instrument which, that we got basically in a nylon bag. There were lots of pieces and we had to make a violin out of that. And this is something which takes time, knowledge, and you hope that you are successful, but uh, you never know until you are done. And I think that's really one of the most special things about the violin as a whole project is uh, those of you who have seen the exhibit, those of you who will see the exhibit, the instruments make beautiful pieces to look at, as, as Emma says, pieces of furniture. They're visually stunning, and it's interesting to learn the story behind them. But what really makes this project special is not that they sit in the, in the cases, in the vitrines, but that they come alive again on the concert stage in the hands of world-renowned virtuosos like Shlomo Mintz, world-class orchestras like the Cleveland Orchestra and the world-class conservatory like the Cleveland Institute of Music. Can you speak a little bit about what that's like for you to have spent maybe 18 months reconstructing this instrument with such loving care and then to hear it sound, resound so beautifully on the stage? It's a good feeling because in the end, Every work that you do for a very long time and you put lots of care and attention into it and in the end someone can really enjoy and appreciate it and tell you, okay, this is good work, this is something that I like. It always, it's a good boost for your ego and it's a, it's a good feeling, there is nothing to do, nothing to say. And how do the musicians respond? Well, of course, musicians, each one is a different person, so some of them are much more emotional, some are a bit more closed, but uh, generally they, they always responded very well. They always were very enthusiastic and happy to play on the instruments. For them also, in a way, it's like playing with another violin is always an interesting intrigue to see what it is, just for the sake of trying another instrument. Um, but they are all, they were all very happy and very much into the project, very supportive. What I can say, looking on the musicians, not in one concert, but in many, always when they are taking the instrument and they know the story, you see the eyes are brilliant. And then when they are giving back the instrument after playing on it, the eyes are much more brilliant. Everyone wanted to know exactly what was the story behind the violin that he played. And many of them, it was so touching, and many musicians approached me. I can tell you that for my surprise, which is not a surprise, let's say, uh, they played the Leonora, and the trumpetist is, the trumpet player was outside the hall, and then in the time until he had to play, he talk to me and say to me, you know, my family perished in the Holocaust and told me the story, a trumpet player, but a trumpet we don't have in the Holocaust, unfortunately. But the violin, I don't know a place that they didn't play until the last minute. If I'm talking about my city, Vilna, there was, there were a brother and a sister, Rabinovich, Nothing can be more Jewish than that. They played until the last moment of the existence of this 
place and every concert. In Kovno, they had a con a orchestra, there's a photo, in the first photo in uh, the exhibition is this orchestra. I'm not going to tell you the horrible stories that I know about it. And they've been almost every time they had these orchestras. They had this chamber music. People are talking about Terezin. Terezin, it was something unbelievable. Every day, almost concerts, they wrote operas there. They played operas there. They played concerts there, what you can see. It was very important to them. And when you are reading books about the Holocaust, you can see many times, a, how you say, eyewitness or e-witness that are telling the men took a woman, took the violin, and then something happened. They were not in the camp. They were outside. They were in concert hall. They were in paradise for five minutes, for ten minutes. But you know what it is in a hell to go to paradise for five minutes for this little instrument, the violin? That's the power of music. That's the power of this little instrument, the violin, right, which is so important. And that's what we are trying to forward, to bring more and more to more people. And here what they are doing in Cleveland, it's unique until today. Thank you for that. I think that would be a good time to maybe answer some of your questions that you might have. But I have another option. Yes, I'll bring you back. And I'll try to repeat your questions so make sure everybody can hear it. Today it's Czechoslovakia, back then it was in between Czechoslovakia and Germany, and these places made decorated instruments. Some were made with Magenta Vid, some with, were with crosses or any other ornaments, and this is how they sold them. And they're done also for gypsies, by the way. This was the biggest quantity of violins, and uh, to feel a little bit not only Holocaust, the famous story with the gypsy's violin was, you see the differences was a Jewish guy kept his violin until the end of his life. For as a gypsy, this was business. And it was a very famous story all the time that the gypsy was playing in the street and some tourist is coming and poof, this is beautiful violin, I would like to buy it from you. And then the gypsy is doing a full story. It's from my grand, 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 grandfather, and it's valuable and blah, 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 blah. But after that he got some good hundred dollars, he sold the violin. He wait two, three minutes. When you see the man out of his sight, he called his little son, go bring another violin from the house. <laughs> and this is a true story. And can you speak a little why would the musicians, you know, trick out, as we say, their, their instruments, why would they decorate them so? Decorating violin was from the first day. We know that one of the kings of France, Louis uh, something, he ordered from Amati, one of the famous violin maker, from the father, a full orchestra of decorated instrument that most of them was spoiled in the revolution. They threw them out from the windows. And this was the first time they had done decoration for a violin. Then people continued to decorate violin. The famous Trolivari decorated many violins, for, especially for kings, dukes, and anybody else. To put a Star of David on a violin, we don't know the first day. But it's something between 1830 to 40. That's the time that we think they have done the first time a decoration of Star of David. Yes, sir. I just noticed that not all of the violins have the Star of David on the back. Did you, is that a decorative? 
Star David that's on the back of the violin. Did you do that to all the violins? We didn't do it to any of the violins. They were there. Well, each violin which had the Star of David still has it. We never added any Star of David. Yes, we started the way it is. The start of the day were at, at by the original numbers that requested it during the, when they ordered the violin. We are changing nothing. Yes. And you see, one of the importance of the violin, it's not only the special sound of it, but one of the things that you have to understand, we, we are saying that the first violin came to the world around 1490, something like that. Until today, it's almost the same quality of sound. And what people heard in Auschwitz or in the ghetto, it was almost the same sound, a little bit smaller, but this is the same sound. So this is something like a memorial to all the people. You have the same sound, they could hear, and you can hear. Yes, sir. exhibition. The Norwegian story, Ole Bull violin, the violin is not here, but the story is something unbelievable, and you discovered some beautiful things about all the story. So, yeah. you are the person to tell the story. <laughs> so, my research took me all over the world, as you can well imagine, uh, including uh, a wonderful trip to, to Norway to unearth one of many stories that was sort of dying to be told. And I was able to uncover newspaper articles and even personal letters uh, that documented a very fascinating story that I don't think any of us really knew before we started. You know, we knew it that, uh, then, but before we approached this violin, uh, it's a really a wonderful story in that this was uh, January of 1941. A very talented concertmaster named Ernst Glaser. He was a concertmaster of the Oslo Philharmonic. He was scheduled to give a concert in, and he was going to give a concerto in the Nazi occupied Bergen, Norway. And as a special treat to the Bergen audience, he was going to bring with him a Guadalajara Jesus, a very precious by Michael Stradivarius, 
Uh, in addition to the answer itself, the answer had an extra value in that it had once been owned by the beloved 19th century Norwegian virtuoso, Ole Bull, who was from Bergen. So the Bergen audience was very excited. And the newspaper articles leading up to it, how excited they were to see that they would be able to hear Ole Bull's violin. That many of that generation had never heard, but always heard of what the beautiful sound of us. The concert began instantly enough with the performance of Haydn's military symphony. About 10 minutes into the Haydn, I learned from one of these letters, uh, a group of teenage boys came in and occupied some of the empty seats in the hall. Some of the concert goers thought it was nice to see young people in the audience, uh, even if they did arrive a little late, but those who were able in the darkness of the concert hall to see the uniforms the boys were wearing knew there's a more sinister truth to it. That these boys were members of the national youth, Norway's version of the Hitler youth. And they had come to the concert expressly to protest the fact that Ernst Klaus, the Jewish concert master from Oslo, was going to be performing in public on Ole Bull's violin. So after the Haydn Symphony, the concerto with Glasgow was, supposed to, was next on the printed program. But nothing happened. There was a long pause. Backstage, the conductor, Carol Heide, was being told by Nazi officials that he had to stop the concert immediately, that Ernst Glaser must not be allowed to perform. Heide refused. He did, however, buy him some time to figure out what to do with the situation by postponing Glaser's performance until later in the program. So he went out to the audience to announce the change. The orchestra would not play Paul Rayner's request to sweep the food from Santa Sea, which came after the concerto on the printed program. The orchestra to play all four movements of the suite. Then again, nothing happened. A long pause. The conductor, Harold Heider, could be seen pacing back and forth behind the orchestra, looking distraught. The orchestra members looked at him and looked at each other in confusion. And finally, Heider had to resign himself to the fact that he would simply be putting Glaser at too much risk if he allowed him to perform. So the conductor, Heider, said, went back to the front of the stage and announced that he was very sorry but that the rest of the concert would have to be canceled. One of the last of youth cried from the balcony, What the hell? Why doesn't he come? And another last of youth cried out, Is it because Glaser is a Jew? And then all the other groups. The Nazi youth started distributing these uh, flyers, and I've seen a couple of them there. They're currently still in the region, they're not intelligent anymore. Uh, protesting the fact that this Jewish peddler is making money off of Ole Bull's violin. Ole Bull's violin they declared as a national treasure. And we can't allow this Jewish peddler to be playing on this, making money off of this national treasure. The lights went up in the concert hall. And then finally everybody could see the uniforms. And in what I think to be one of the most heroic moments in all of the history of music, the audience came to Glaser's defense. And fist fights broke out throughout the concert hall uh, in defense of Glaser. Uh, a letter I discovered uh, from an uh, elderly woman uh, recalls striking one of the Nazi buildings in the head with the handle of her umbrella. Uh, a member of the orchestra stood up and tore off his tuxedo jacket and jumped into the, the bloody uh, fracas uh, to, to join the fist fights in defense of Glaser. Before the police could get too far out of control, and the conductor, Harold Heiden, left back up to the podium and instructed the orchestra, Play the national anthem, damn it! <laughs> the orchestra rose and played the opening chords of Norway's national anthem. Now, in Norway, as is true here in America, when one hears the national anthem, one is to go to stand, stop what everyone is doing, stand up at attention, and sing along. And uh, the conductor, Heiden, knew this. And so while the members of the, the audience were singing, and while the national youths were singing, standing there at attention, their right arms extended to the infamous Nazi salute, how to make sure that Ernst Glaser and Ole Bull's violin were whisked to safety out the backstage door. And today, the two sons of Ernst Glaser, one is a top cellist, and the other one is a top pianist. And when we are doing our project, 
And we can have these violins are coming to our concert also if we cannot have these violins. So the music is continuing. And Ernst Klasse had a very, very special repetition in uh, Bergen. And he's coming from Hamburg, by the way. And uh, his son is looking like a kibbutznik. When you see him, you are asking for which kibbutz is coming. So, how you say? Small word. Somebody over there. Yes, sir. The question is why there were orchestras in the camp, because it is, from our standpoint, impossible to imagine at most. The, the orchestra's primary function was to play every morning and every evening as the work details marched out, even in rows of five, and then return at the end of the day. So the very, sorry to say, very German thing to, to have the music, but to instill marching discipline so that they could stay in step by hearing the oom of the, the schmaltz of German marches. That was the main function, but they also would play when the trains would arrive. And so, for these Jewish prisoners, of course now it seems only a fifth of that they were on the way to Auschwitz. But at the time, they had no idea where they were going. They were crammed into these, into these cattle cars and taken to death who knows. And when the doors were open, yes, they, they threw the barking of dogs and uh, lots of yelling, but they also see a beautifully manicured law and an orchestra play. And so, where are we? Who knows what kind of these place be? There's an orchestra. And so, as they were working their way out to the, from the trains to the selection, where you know those who were healthy enough to do labor were sent in one direction, and the elderly and the young and the sick and the pregnant were sent straight to the gas chambers. They didn't know what had happened. So the ones who were selected to work only when they got into the camp proper did they find out what was happening at that moment to the family members who had been sent in the opposite direction. The orchestra would also play concerts on Sundays for the SS guards and the commandants. For them, it gave them a feeling of this really sick nobility, like these old patrons. They had their estate. And they have their own orchestra that, that plays at their command and it made them feel uh, sort of proud in a very, very strange way. But there were, uh, there was a 120 piece symphony orchestra in the main camp of Auschwitz. And there were orchestras in both the men's and women's camps of Fair Canal. And ensembles throughout the sub camps of, of a large complex where you collectively refer to as Auschwitz. But there were also orchestras throughout the entire Nazi camp system. Yes, ma'am, I don't want to get some questions over there. Very simple, it's going back to Tel Aviv. And uh, January, February. February, my son is going with Zio Levy, the conductor that's coming here, and uh, Shlomo Mintz and Yad Ashkin, they are going to Mexico to, to make the, a project of violence of hope. And the second question? The second question is where the violins live when they're not on display. In our workshop, in special suitcases, uh, cases for violins, and in a safe that nobody can touch them. I mean, there's, there's some people who've been very patient. Yes, sir. You seem to know a lot about music and history. Do you have an opinion on Daniel Barrymore? His question is about the pianist and conductor Daniel Barrymore. Let's not go into that. Let's go <laughs> That's a political question. I played chamber music with Daniel when I was young, and he was young. And I prefer not to answer to this question because of what he's doing in these days. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. What do you think that switched the violin? Oh, many, many, many years ago. He didn't switch. He plays both. He's playing violin and viola. I know, so Shlomo is playing violin and viola. Many the, violinists uh, play violin and viola. 
No, I heard him now with the concert on the violin twice. And then I can tell you that the first time that he played on a viola in Israel, he played on my viola. No, if that can bragging with that. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, did you, uh, how did you get interested? How did you find out about this? And, and what, you know, what made you start to investigate or to write the book? And second, um, you said that you were born in two months before the war in 1939. Um, where, what was the timeline? How did your parents get to Israel? And how did your wife's parents get to Israel? Let me start. Let's start with the second question first. For Adnan, when, when your parents came to Israel, my father was Zionist. Thirty-eight, he decided to come to Israel. He took my mother. He went to Israel by boat, of course. They arrived. In the beginning, he was working with the orangery, with orange. Yeah. Then he began to teach violin and then open a little workshop someplace, and then a bigger one, and then in the place that we are until today. My wife, she was born after the war, we can say, in Germany, in a camp, and they came to Israel, I think, 46 or 47, I don't remember exactly the day. And the first question she asked was for me, which was uh, how I became involved in this project. And the answer to that is that I am a professor of music at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And in 2012, my university brought 18 of the violins of hope to our city. Uh, it was uh, the first, and until now, the only kind that they had been on display in the Western Hemisphere. And this, as with Cleveland, it was a smaller scale, uh, but this was still several years, the project several years in the making, putting it together partnerships with the Charlotte Symphony and other museums and and cultural institutions. And so uh, throughout that, I wasn't a member of the team that was bringing the violins to Charlotte, but I was a member of the faculty. And so they were telling us, okay, this is a big initiative, we're working on this, here's what this project is. And uh, as a musician, as a historian, I became really fascinated by what I was learning. So in 2011, I took a trip to Israel and, and spent a week with, with Adam in his shop and learned about his journey and more about the instruments and it was during that trip that I became inspired to write this book about the violence book. Maybe let's let's get this young lady then into the back. There is one viola here, but it's coming from the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. In the camps, in Dresdenstadt, they've had violas, because it was a huge orchestra there. Other places, it's very difficult to know, because there was not registration. Today, a concert with violin, viola, and cello, but there are many posters that you can see the program. But... Um, I cannot answer the, this question exactly. We it's don't have any, any, any instrument other than violin to survive the world. There might be some things out there, but we don't know. Uh, one day we'll get one. Uh, I think you've been very patient. Thank you. I'm sorry, were any of the violins Italian? Oh, Italian. There were Italian violins confiscated by the German. Nobody can find them anymore. I'm sorry for that. Because uh, we know even that some of the German ministers gave it, for example, to a Japanese a violinist, and she wanted to give it before dying to Israel, and then when the family discover the value of this violin, nobody knows anymore about this instrument. Yeah, that instrument is at least said to be a Stradivarius, but the family won't let anybody look at it. No. Uh, because they're afraid that to look at it would be defined as 
to discover its true provenance, and then they have to they might have to give it up. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you all very much for